This whole time. Greetings and welcome back once again, everyone. This is Amuna Yisrael. Welcome to the channel. I was just talking to myself for quite some time. I thought I was live. I was explaining to everyone that um, I had a little snaffle with my phone yesterday. Water touched the phone and I can't see. The screen is a little bit dark, so we're going to have to work with it till I find out what's going on with it. Put it in rice and everything. Water just messed up my phone. But nonetheless, we transmitted. So I said I was coming live today to talk about um, give people who an opportunity to speak sometimes <clears throat> and, and barriers to communication is a topic right sometimes when we are texting on these social media platforms or it's just a one-way video and we can't actively real-time engage with the person we can walk away from that interaction uh, confused or come to the wrong conclusion because we're talking in different mediums one is on video one is on text so this is also an open live if you would like to come and join just let me know hopefully I can see and then you can come on why because it's different sometimes when people are speaking face to face versus typing and doing you know the whole keyboard gangster thing now I wanted to talk about a topic that right now is currently happening which is the way in which we respond Bond to things that happen on social media, the way in which we feel we have the right to um, speak about one another on social media, right? And then how we feel about it all. For some people, it's entertaining. For other people, it's life. With, you know, they go around and their whole day is messed up. But I wanted to take myself, for example, as it relates to this recent discussion and, you know, blow up, which is... <clears throat> I watched someone's content. Yeah, it came up. I watched the content. I responded to the content by going to my social media. Actually, I actually responded underneath the content on his page and shared my thoughts there. And then I came to my space and said, yo, I can't. It's like somebody watching a movie and be like, yo, the movie was good. The movie was not good. You know, watching Handmaiden's Tale or the new whatever. The people come to their social media spaces and express themselves. Now, in doing so, you have people who may be in your personal space who has interfaced with that movie or with that person or with that video. And they want to discourse. That's fine. That's what social media is for. Yes. The part that gets me that makes it a barrier is when people feel entitled to go beyond expressing their thought about what you said, but then they go into like this whole tug of war back and forth. I'm going to disface you. I'm going to disrespect you and do all of these things to prove my point. <clears throat> it just is an extension of how we the people act in the real world. This is a virtual world, and then there's a real world. And it shows you where the breakdown in communication is. I spoke about this many years ago, we'll continue to, that communication is commerce. I've said this. I did a video a long, long time ago on Dr. Boyce Watkins. Shout out to you. I did many videos on my... Communication is commerce. So if we have barriers to communication, if we have breakdown in communication, if we have ineffective communication, then we are broke in this area. It's like if you have, if you go over budget, if you don't produce enough money, if um, you don't know how to deal with issues when they arise, if you have a business, you will be broke. So if we don't tie communication with commerce, then we're going to miss a lot of things. Now, this particular conversation that I started around this Kevin Samuels, uh, I don't want to call the brother character, this man, right, is expression that what I received from your communication is that something is not altogether there. It's like somebody going into your business and they say, the, the pro, they do a Yelp. What I received from this business, the food was X, Y, and Z. This is why they have all of these feedback loops and channels to say, what is it that you feel about this? How do you rate this? You go on Amazon, they ask you, did you receive the product? Was it on time? They want communication. That's because it's linked to commerce. We don't see it in our daily interactions because we're not seeing the actual physical money or your Bitcoin. So we don't think that it's linked to commerce, but it is. 
because we're always projecting. We're always either buying or selling. That's why it says buy the truth, right? A proverbial saying within the Torah, the Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. Why is it using economical terms, commerce related terms to a, a, a principle of truth? Why? Why is that buy the truth and sell it not? Why are those two things linked? Anyway, my point being, I found it interesting and I always do. For those who may be new, welcome. My name is Amuna. Sometimes I get hype, sometimes I'm chill, but I'm always talking about growth and edification. You can almost guarantee if I'm going to be commenting on anything, whether it be a principle, something metaphysical, or somebody in our everyday reality, it's going to be to look for the deeper meaning in whatever it is that I'm looking at, and I feel that it has value and I share it. For those who may not know, even though I don't go around touting this long resume of who I've sat amongst and who I've spoken to and how many books I've read, if it, the conversation calls for it, you will have me speak about it. If the conversation doesn't call for it, you may have to Google it. Now, for those who feel it the need to try to um, belittle me in particular, of this conversation and deface me by thinking that you're going to hurl things at the wall and I'm going to be emotionally triggered, that's not going to happen. Because what I've been speaking about is what I do, which is do the work. Deactivate your own triggers. Because if you don't, people will come into your sphere and try to control you. If you can control my emotions, you can control me. So if I already know about myself and know what the, 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 um, the, the advantages and deficits, the, the, the strengths and the weaknesses, nothing that you can do to try to throw at the wall is going to work. Like every ad hominem attack, I've probably already done a show on it. <laughs> I've probably already sat down and thought about it and invited people to the conversation, which I always do ever since I come on social media. I invite people to the conversation. Whether or not they choose to come, that's on them. But no one could accuse me like, yo, Muna, I always, hey, everybody, let your thoughts be heard. Box below, you want to come on, chat, we can do that. I feel the need to come out and say that because sometimes new people come around and they, they, you, they disagree with you. And I hardly like blocking people. You really have to like push, push and push and push and just show that you are just not in the space of being respectful at all for me to really block you. Because I think that dissenting voices and opposing thought processes is what's needed to bring out the things that we need to hear and understand and speak about. But one thing I don't tolerate and I will not tolerate and I never tolerate is disrespect. I don't disrespect you. You don't disrespect me. You can disagree, but we got to keep it clean and professional. Now, to touch a little bit on, on feminism, people keep throwing this word around like it's going to make somebody melt like the Wicked Witch of the West in, in The Wizard of Oz. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's really juvenile to just be like, oh, you're a feminist. You're educate 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 we've done shows on that we've done shows about feminism and how these words are weaponized and why they're used to control we've already looked into these things those are on record they're all on record they're all on record so if somebody may have a question and they may be concerned just go back and you know reel back the tape and go listen to some of the things that have been said now that we got that out the way I do find it entertaining, but at some points, you know, sometimes I'll be laughing and it don't be funny. You really have to address some stuff. Let's just, let's just, the only way we're going to elevate and move forward, which is what I've been talking about, like Facebook will bring you up um, memories from 2010 and when I first came on here. Look at the memories from 10 years ago when I was a whole decade younger and see if I wasn't on the same stuff. The only thing is, each time I just learn a little bit more, grow a little bit more, release a little bit of the toxicity, and just keep look at it. I'd be amazed myself, like, wow, okay, I was on that then? Okay. So I say all that to say, sometimes we just have to set the record straight. This is about growth. It's about healing. It's about elevation. It's about truth-telling. 
It's about being respectful. And I understand a lot of people are not in that space and this may not be for you. I've had people be like, nah, I'm not on that. And then they'll come back years later and be like, oh, you know, you was talking that stuff. Da, da, da. I just wasn't ready to hear that. It's not my job to be saying they're holding people's hand and be like, you're going to get what I'm talking about right now. It's just like other people may be saying something and I may not be ready for it. And years later, I come back and be like, oh, okay, I can hear it now. I can receive it now. Our minds are like soil. You don't plant in rainy season. I don't know what season you are in in your life. But if you're in a rainy season or if you're in the winter in your life, I may be planting seed because or sharing my thoughts and you may not be in the season to receive it. I can't, I don't have no control over that. We all receive things at the time in which we're ready to receive them. That's okay. What's not okay is talking about relationships when you can't relate. <laughs> you don't know how to relate. You feel, refuse to relate in a respectful way. And yet still you want to come and school somebody on relationships. That to me is just like, it, it is nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. If you want to tout yourself as a relationship expert, then one has to show themselves um, capable of modeling, not just speaking about the way in which you should relate, modeling this behavior. How do people walk away from the interaction with you? Were you truthful and open and honest with them? Did you destroy them on their way out? Were you sadistic and, and, and in your manner of... You know, all of these things last with people as they go on. Anyway, barriers to communication. If you want to come on this live, I'm not going to stay long. Why? Because my battery is a little low. I had to do that because sometimes I don't. A lot of times I don't. And, and, then, and then I'm just like... <sighs> Seriously. Anyway. My mother shared a piece of paper, a paper with me, um, and I wanted to share it with you guys. I have a few of them, but today we're going to talk about barriers to communication. Prematurely, number one, shifting the subject or avoiding topics. Have you ever or do you, when you speak to somebody, before we can fully, you throw something out there, and before you can fully explore this topic, boom, they go into one, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. And you're like, wait a minute, whoa, 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 let's come back come back right here why are we prematurely avoiding the topic and shifting the subject so that we don't address so that we don't dig in one of the things that we used to do when we were hosting um the relationship challenge was and again for those who don't know the relationship challenge was a show that ran for three seasons i was the host of that show go back and listen to how i spoke to men how i spoke to women how i spoke to men i didn't agree with and how i spoke to women i didn't agree with right so as a host, somebody who's seasoned as a host, I find it very weird and peculiar how when somebody invites you, because when you're a host, that means you're inviting someone in to your space that you govern. And, and that's where the hospitality industry comes in. The hospitality industry is that this hotel or this restaurant is hosting you. That's why the person who comes to you is the hostess. And how they treat you as a guest in their space reflects on you as the business owner and you as the host. So I have to use this comparison because this is what's bringing about this conversation. One of the suspect things that I notice is that Kevin Samuels as a host is inhospitable. And the thought process is that once you come into my space, and I actually heard the brother say this, once you come into his space, he pisses on his territory. And once you come into his space, if you, he pisses on you, it's because you want it to be pissed on. That's suspect to me. Because talking about hospitality, talking about being a host, and justifying that if I ill-treat you and you came here, it's because you wanted to be ill-treated, that's suspect. But I'll continue. So one other thing that I notice is that sometimes when people want to push their agenda and they don't want to deal with the topic at hand, they shift the subject really quickly. So like I was saying, one of the things that I... Um, and I might have to break this down because it's 15 of them. I don't think I'm going to get through all 15. One of the things that I used to do, and we used to do, me, myself, sister, Mayana, Sal, when we used to sit, sit down, what did we want to talk about? And made it so niche 
that we can, at the end of the conversation, we can get something out of it. We're able to glean something out of it. Because if we don't, what happens is, what I learned by from being a host and have to mediate is that when somebody doesn't want to answer something, they go something like, well, the better question would be, right? So I'm going to take you over here because I don't want to address and I don't want to acknowledge what you said. And part of that has to do with respect. It's either A, we don't want to admit, you know what, I'm not really versed in that. So I'm not ready to answer that question right now. Or that question hits too close to home and it's going to make me feel uncomfortable and it's going to expose me. So let me shift the topic. We're humans. We're all humans. So when something may feel uncomfortable with us, it's like if something was hurting your back or your leg, you feel uncomfortable. Naturally, you're going to want to shift. Why? Because leaning on that spot is a pressure point and it's making you feel uncomfortable. So in conversations, when someone prematurely shifts the subject to avoid a topic is because it may be making them feel uncomfortable for many reasons and slowing the conversation down to acknowledge that and gently bringing them back to the topic at hand. Because who wants to engage in discussion where everything that you bring up is dismissed, but everything that the person brings up is valid? That shows you that there's not a level of mutual respect between the parties who are exchanging. Let me go back. So if communication is commerce, when you go into a store, this will be akin to the person's wares in the store has no value. And the only thing that has value is your money. So because you are bringing your money into the store, you can talk to the people anyway in your mind. You can throw the stuff all over the place. You can demand that the people do this because the only people in your mind that has value is you, your money. But the people who's giving you the service deserve to be treated. That's imbalanced, that's unhealthy, and that is toxic. So I took it in a personal space. We see it on social media where you may post something and somebody comes and totally derails your post. Somebody comes and toes it left. You ask a question. I do a lot of community conversation. Here comes somebody throwing it left. Nothing that has to do with anything. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can we stay on point? Can we stop deflecting? Can we deal with the situation at hand? And the, also, if you jumble the situation, then we can stay in confused and you can keep the people confused and you will never get to a resolution. So if you're in a relationship with somebody and you're experiencing this, it's meant to keep you frustrated. It's meant to throw you off the course. It's meant to show you that, listen, if you're the person who's doing it, you're trying to gain control over that person and over the conversation. And so therefore, you don't want to hear anything that anybody has to say that may shine light negatively on you. If you're the person that is being done to, it's showing you that you are in a compromised situation where the other person is solely in control and you do not have any control. And the respect is only one way, right? Second, I'm only going to do three today because my phone is probably going to go out. Overgeneralizing. This is another pet peeve of mine. And oftentimes we have to qualify statements. Not all, but some. I say that often. And people who don't want to overgeneralize and who want to actually be more um, accurate with what they're saying, they will qualify their statement. Because overgeneralizing is used to paint a picture of reality that is really not so. Again, this is the way we manipulate one another in discussion. Everybody is doing it. I don't know why you're not on board. Everybody sees that everybody like all how many billion people is in the world, everybody. When somebody starts having the conversation with you in that way, it means that they're trying to paint whatever the subject matter is in a way that you cannot contest what they're saying. I want to skew your viewpoint so that I can get my desired income. Remember, commerce is exchange. Communication is exchange. If it's not even exchange, if I'm devaluing your money, if I'm devaluing your thoughts, if I'm devaluing your experience, it means that I want to inflate my own. What are we dealing with now in society? Inflation. That means you're going to have to have more of one thing to get the same thing that you used to have less of. So again, if we transpose these things, the things that are not so, so, um, clear to see in communication because it's words and unless you write them down they just pass us and they hit us in the spirit but when you write them down they become physical 
right? The things that we're not able to see, but we're able to feel, if we grasp them in a way that we can say, oh, wow, I see what you're doing, then we can navigate our way through some of these very toxic, oftentimes toxic situations. So overgeneralizing is also a red flag and a barrier to communication. I'm gonna give one more, like I said, because today the phone is gonna die. Asking excessive questions. I have been guilty of this in times past. It's a control drama. I talk about it in Solonomics. It's the interrogator. The interrogator will ask a number of questions back to back, blah, 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 rapid fire, to confuse and daze the person who you're speaking with so that you can show that you don't know what you're talking about. So because this used to be a style of communication that before when I wasn't aware and now I'm more aware, I can admit that asking excessive questions without allowing the person the opportunity to answer them is a way in which, again, why does somebody like bomb, 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 jab in the ring? It's so that the person could be dazed and confused and eventually, you know, just bow out like, yo, I tap out. I can't even have a conversation with you. Yeah. So these are some barriers to communication. Like I said, there are 15 on this list. Those were three. So the first three is prematurely shifting the subject or avoiding topics, overgeneralizing, which is also a, um, a logical fallacy. This over a generalizing and shifting topics, you know, sometimes that's red herrings. Like you throw something in there that has nothing to do with anything. So really, this is a list of logical fallacies um, that we're going to uh, go through. And they're just put in more layman's terms for us to understand that this is what's happening. And this is why some people may be more easier to talk to and communicate with than others. And the third one is asking excessive questions, right? And usually the person, if you're in a relationship with a person who asks excessive questions, based on my research, if you are the person who's asking the excessive questions or the interrogator type, you may have an aloof person, a person who is just meh, meh about everything because they know that it, you, you are like pull, pulling the energy out of them. Because when we're, at, we're requiring something of somebody, when I ask you a question, I'm requiring that you respond to me right and so that person usually manifests somebody who's just like eh, you know give you one word answers because they want you to continue to it could be two things as a response to just leave me alone I don't have time yeah no okay maybe in that way or you may have the person who wants you to pull it out of them they want you to dig deep and ask them what's the matter. They want you to go in there. And so they'll have, they'll want to talk. They'll want to express, but they want you to be sucked into their world because they know that you're going to ask all the questions that makes them feel good about themselves. So these are all of the, um, not all, but these are some of the ways in which we're also manipulated in conversation. We're manipulated in our communication and we're manipulated in relationships. And so, again, like, let, let me wrap it up. One of my contentions about anybody who's promoting relationships is that if your model, if your principle, if the base of the relationship type that you're promoting is not healthy, then you're leading people basically down a rabbit hole. And you're giving them solutions that will work temporarily, but when they look around and the person who they followed, whoever it may be, is not there, they have to live with the choices that they made. Like somebody can advise you, I can advise you, they can advise you, anyone can advise you, your doctor can advise you, but the choices that you make, only you can live with. You can look to blame, you know, say that person, you're telling me this, I'm going to follow them, and you follow them, but you have to live with it. I have to live with it. One of real life examples is when my children were younger, and we used to go to the doctor, and the doctor's, you know, pediatrician, and they're advising this and advising that, I say, wait, hold on, hold on. Write that down for me. Let me know the name of what you're talking about. Let me see, because I'm going to go look it up. And they're looking at me like, I said, because you can advise me, but it's up to me as to whether or not I'm going to take your advice. Because at the end of the day, if anything happens, I am going to have to deal with the consequence and the fallout about the choices that I made. And what people like to do is they like to invite you into the hot water and then leave you there. Because that's their job as a salesperson. If they're trying to sell you something, their job is, yeah, you look good in that car. Yup, that looks good for you. You know what I'm saying? Because they're going to get commission or whatever they're trying to sell you. 
You know what I mean? Oh, if I was you, yup, I would go for the no, I would go for the top tier one. Oh, oh absolutely. And they they paint this whole picture, but when that car payment comes, that salesperson is not there with you. When the insurance comes, that salesperson is not. They already did their job. They did the job. So I, we have to teach accountability that at the end of the day, whoever you follow, whoever advice you adhere to, take it with a grain of salt. Because you're going to have to be like, if you say, you know, this is the type of woman that I'm going to attract or this is the type of man, you're the one who's going to have to live with it. You know what I'm saying? It's like the people who go get the surgery, like the girl who, uh, what's her name? K. Michelle. She came on, Iyanla Fix My Life. And she bought into, you have to look this way and you have to look that way and go and get booty surgery and go and get all of these things. And now she can hardly even literally sit on her own behind. And she's upset and she's angry because you took the advice or you adhered to the peer pressure and you did this thing. The doctor doesn't have problems sitting on his own behind. You understand what I'm saying? They don't have, um, what do they call that thing that they develop? All the immune deficiency. You do. Because ultimately we are responsible for the choices that we make, male or female. I said it again, male or female. Man or or woman, whoever makes the choice deals with the consequence. I did leave you one more Torah story. We know the story. Jacob and his mother, Rebecca. They want something to come about. Rebecca says, no worry, my son. Just do it. And then she says, let the sin be upon her. Jacob was kind of uncertain. He was like, Ma, I don't know. This is kind of sus. What you're asking me to do is a bit much. I can see where you're coming from. You have some points. I feel you, but nah, I don't feel too right about this. It's making me feel, you know. His mother says, no worry, son. She reassures him. You look good in it. It's your blessing. Go take it this way. This is how you're supposed to get it. How else are we going to get it? You see, so you use all the rational, logical ways to say that this is the right choice to make. But at the end of the day, Jacob had to deal with the choices he made. Jacob was the one who gets beguiled by Laban. Jacob is the one who has to live the next 20 something years in this space where he's wondering how did I get here? And how he got there was by having to leave the house prematurely because now his brother is after him and he has to go out before he's ready and he comes into all of these things because someone else told you, mother, father, sister, brother, I give you advice, but don't worry, it's going to be on me. That's not how the universe is set up. That's not how the universe is set up. I can't see your comments because like I said, water got into the phone yesterday and it's all jacked up so i have to take it and see what's wrong with it but i'll have to read it on the computer but my point is anybody who tell who's giving you this advice that's why i say it's very important to say what is the source where is this coming from where is this coming from and what is the source people feel it as oh you're attacking the person because i'm asking what is the source if i where's a bottle of water here is a bottle of water the name on it is eternal. They tell me naturally alkaline spring water. I'm feeling that. I like alkalinity. Go Dr. Sabi, sleep in peace, right? There's some truth that's transmitted. I like the feeling that it's giving me. This is all they put on the front of the bottle. It speaks to me. But when you want to know what's the source, where is this water coming from, you have to turn it to the back. That means you have to do a little bit of investigation. Now, some people will say, this is the front of the bottle. It looks good. It makes me feel good. It quenches my thirst. It speaks to all of my needs. Why are you being so nosy? Why are you being so negative? Why are you defacing somebody? Because I'm asking you, what's the source? Let me tell you something. In the food industry, A, you have to have licensing. Number one, I know a little bit about a little bit because I'm in the food industry. And B, when you're making product for mass consumption you have to let the people know where it is coming from so if you turn around any food package you're going to see what the company wants you to know and then you're going to see the requirement for selling this food package so 
y'all know I gotta take my glasses off because lately my eyes. It says Eternal Beverage Inc. Walnut Creek, Can uh, California, nine four five nine seven. Source. Source. Springbrook Springs, New York. That wasn't insulting. That wasn't defacing. That wasn't. That wasn't like, oh my goodness, I can't believe. That's a, that's that's a thought. That's a requirement. Where is this coming from? For instance, Dasani. I don't drink Dasani. You see reports that come out on Dasani. Dasani. I'm a water drinker. For those who, so I like drinking water. So you see Dasani and the reports that come out on Dasani, and the people are like, yo, be careful with Dasani. Why? Because Dasani is produced by Pepsi. What does that mean? That's just reclaimed such and such water. So for people who care about that and not just, oh, it's quenching my thirst at the time, I care about where the source is coming from, you just simply flip the back and look. I say that to say when people are talking and we're sharing with one another and something you're agreeing with, whatever, whatever, but something is like, ah, uh, I have a question. You flip the back. And you say, okay, this person talked about themselves. I want to know where the source of this information is coming from. It's just like um, what people will say, well, what's wrong with being clairvoyant or what's wrong with, um, what do they do? Readings. You have prophets and then you have people who are psychics. The source, <laughs> where is it coming from? Are you getting dreams and visions from the creator or you get dreams and visions from demons? or other spiritual entities the source is important where are you getting your information from where are you sourcing what you're telling the people what is the baseline principle why because then that's going to explain to me why you're leaning a certain way so for all the people who has now made critical thinking and logical thinking illegal i'm sorry maybe a moon is not your flavor but for those who say, you know what, critical thinking, let me see where this is coming from so that I know where I'm following it to. Where do they, these breadcrumbs lead? Another, another drink that's in question right now is Naked. Naked says it's all natural. It's supposed to be um, this natural drink of smoothies, this, that, and the third. And they're like, wait a minute, they're suing them. Why are they suing them? Because what you're promoting is not what it really is. And by the way, Naked is also produced by Pepsi. When a lot of these big box companies saw that health food was coming up, they started to buy out the little man. And then they started to produce it with labels that lead you to believe, labels that lead you to believe this is healthy. Another person I just found out is my children like to eat Lara Bar. It's the date bar with the nuts. I don't know how many people know Lara Bar. So I was looking up, I make something similar, and I'm like, I like Lara Bar because you can hardly find anything that doesn't have any added sugar and anything that's natural if you just need a quick snack at the store. So they mommy Lara Bar, Lara Bar, Lara Bar, Lara Bar. So one day I got curious and I looked up Lara Bar. Come to find out, Lara Bar been sold the company to guess who? General Mills. So Lara Bar does not even produce Lara Bar anymore. Now this big box company, which is General Mills, produces Lara Bar. And the thing we need to know about when big box corporations get something that used to be holistic, something that used to be um, made with love, as they say, what happens is now it's all about commerce. It's all about the bottom line and profits. And so what they begin to do is substitute for ingredients because it's cheaper. So I can make more profits if I cut my truthful ingredients to make it cheaper to produce, then I can take more cream off the top. So if you notice, most companies that started off with mom and pop putting in all the quality ingredients, as it goes up the ladder, the quality of the product gets compromised because somebody's looking to cut corners. We do this with communication as well. So when you go back to somebody's earlier work, when there wasn't that much people around and they had more time and they were more thoughtful, you may see something different. And when you come to the later work where it's now required for you to 
push out a video a day and it's required for you to keep talking and it's required for you to just say anything to keep the algorithm going, you start to see the quality of production go down. You start to see the quality of information that you share go down. This is why as somebody who's been on these type of platforms for a while, I'm like, I cannot follow those trends because it's going to compromise who I am. A, I'm sharing out of my overflow oftentimes, right? Not out of, um, oh, I just need people to watch my videos because if they don't, I, you know, for me, when you get into that space, it's like making music for mass consumption. It begins to become compromised because you're in a space where people are demanding as opposed to you're producing it um, because that's what you need to do and that's what you want to share with the world. Anyway, I say all that to say I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We're going to come back again and talk about, it's like I said, it's 15 things on the list. If you missed it, feel free to go back. We're talking about barriers to communication. Um, I spoke about prematurely shifting the subject or avoiding topics, overgeneralizing and ex asking excessive questions. We'll come back and do the next um, few tomorrow. So with that said, again, if you want to come on on the screen, feel free to let me know. I'm a hospital host. I know how to entertain. You understand? <laughs> well, thank everybody for tuning in. I got to find out what's wrong with this phone. I'm sorry I can't see. I can't see your comments. It's just crazy. But we'll talk again. <laughs>